So, let's now go into the topic of certainty in Islam Because before you start discussing doubts Let's discuss what is certainty in the Islamic tradition Because some of us, we think The only way to be certain If you see something Right? But this is wrong This is absolutely wrong This is not the Islamic concept of certainty Oh, I have to see it, bro To believe it, right? We have this famous kind of line If I see it, I believe it, right? And we have this wrong approach that sometimes we think that you have to have full knowledge of something to actually believe it to be true. That's not true either. Certainty in Islam has levels, okay? There are levels of certainty in the Islamic tradition. And we have this from the Quran itself. For example, the three levels are as follows. The first level is called Ilmul Yaqeen, the Yaqeen of knowledge. Which basically means that you know something to be true based upon its concepts, right? Like one plus one is equal to two. You know this, this is a knowledge-based truth. One plus one is equal to two. You have another concept of certainty, which is based on what? Ayn al The certainty of seeing something, of experiencing something. For example, I know there are more than three people in this room, right? Certain, based on, based on what I've just seen. And you could argue it's based on knowledge as well because you're counting, right? But the point here, an aspect of this certainty is based on what I've just seen, right? I know that planes exist. I know that trees exist based upon what I've seen. This is certainty of the eye. Then you have another type of certainty, which is Haq al yaqeen Which is the certainty of it being true within itself Like for example, I would even argue The very fact that Allah deserves worship is Haq al yaqeen He is the self-evident reality Right? That everything depends upon If everything is dependent Then they must be dependent on something that's independent This for me is not just based on knowledge it's not based on seeing something, it's based on it being true by the very fact that it's true. Right? It's necessary, necessarily true. For example, if you, were op- if you were to open your fridge and on top of the egg box you found an iPhone, you're not going to open the fridge, look at the iPhone on top of the egg box, close the fridge and say, it had to be there. No, you're going to question, why is it there? There's nothing necessary about its existence. Because it could have not been there, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is necessary for everything else to exist, right? And that's what we mean by something being haq al yaqeen. It's true by the very fact of it being in existence. Its very truth is self evident, is necessary. Because if it wasn't necessary, then we couldn't exist. Because we're all dependent. And therefore, all of these dependent things had to be dependent on something independent, right? And this has been discussed in the books of Aqidah. For example, Aqidah Tahawiyah, if you look at some of the commentaries, they go deep into this argument. I don't want to get into the argument, but I just want to give you the concept that there is an idea of something being true by virtue of its own existence, right? So these are the three levels of certainty. So don't think that you have to know everything about everything to be certain. That's wrong. Don't think you have to have seen everything in order for you to be certain, that's also wrong. So you have to understand there are ranges of certainty concerning the the concept in Islam. Now there is a really interesting example, there is ikhtilaf on the understanding of this ayah, but I'm just bringing this point across, I'm going to talk about what Razi said about this ayah. But if you know the famous famous ayah concerning Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he said, my Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Allah said, have you not believed? He said, yes, but I ask only that my heart may be satisfied. Allah said, take four birds and commit them to yourself. Then after slaughtering them, put on each hill a portion of them, then call them, they will come flying to you in haste and know that Allah is exalted in might and wise. Now, Razi, he mentions something very interesting here. He basically says that this means that there were degrees of certainty and Ibrahim alayhi salam wasn't doubtful about Allah's power he didn't doubt the existence of Allah he didn't doubt the power of Allah 
but rather he wanted to reach the higher level of certainty, right? Ilm al yaqeen, ayn al yaqeen, haq al yaqeen, right? So this is one opinion of, of, of Razi that basically it's got nothing to do with the fact that he doubted. He's a messenger, he won't doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But rather his heart he be satisfied so he, he increases what you call maybe spiritual certainty based on what we've just discussed earlier. Now, so now we know there are levels of certainty in Islam. You don't have to know everything in order to be certain. You don't have to see everything in order for you to be certain, okay? So, how do we have a basic level of certainty in Islam? Now, you have to understand something very important. The Islamic tradition doesn't start with doubt. I repeat, Islam does not start with doubt. It starts with truth. The Western tradition starts with doubt. And one of the major reasons why the Western tradition starts with doubt, if you read the works of Descartes and others, is because they had the problem of the Catholic Church as an authority. It was their testimony, their command, their decree, what they said had to be true. And obviously if you study European history, there was chaos and war, the 80 year wars, the 30 year wars, the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day, it was, it was mad, right? There was religious wars religiously inspired wars. That's why you had the 16th century Protestant Reformation. And you, as a result of that, you had the philosophers that basically wanted to challenge the authority of the church, essentially, or challenge the kind of, you know, belief that the church is always right. It's self-evidently right. So they wanted to start with, well, how do we now formulate knowledge? So they said, well, you start with doubt. And hence you had the famous Cartesian doubt I think therefore I am but before that he basically had lots of doubts you know maybe even God is tricking me but then he changed it and said no I don't know it's like maybe it's the devil uh, but he, he first started with God but he realized what age he was living in and if he carried on with that narrative he probably was hanged he could have been hanged so he said maybe a demon it could be tricking me that these truths are true right so he was basically started with a form of skepticism and then he basically said how do I anchor all knowledge and he anchored it to himself the very fact that he thinks, that therefore he is. I think, therefore I am. So the, the Western tradition, generally speaking, is entrenched in skepticism. But the Islamic tradition, although we have a healthy type of skepticism, but it's not a skepticism based on the fundamentals, right? We don't have skepticism based on the fundamentals. We have skepticism maybe based on fiqh, on jurisprudence. There's a healthy discussion on jurisprudence, right? There's a healthy discussion on these issues, but when it comes to the fundamentals, we don't start with doubt. We start with truth. Now why? Let me explain. In the Islamic tradition, we have the concept of the fitrah, right? Fatrah, which you have words like fatrun and fatrahu, meaning Allah has created something within us that is a capacity that can facilitate truth, the acknowledgement of truth. What are these basic truths? That Allah exists and He deserves worship. And other ulama said, it's basic moral truths, like general good and general bad, okay? So three main aspects that the fitrah facilitates. It facilitates coming to the truth that Allah exists, He deserves to be worshipped, and basic good and evil, according to the mainstream ulama, from Al-Ghazali, and specifically Ibn Taymiyyah, because he discusses more than anybody else, okay? So we have this concept of fitrah. Now the fitrah is not knowledge, all right? Because Allah says in the Quran that He created you from your mother's womb knowing nothing. So it's not knowledge, but rather it's like a capacity. If you, if you study electronics, there's a thing called a capacitor. What does a capacitor do? It takes in energy, right? If I remember my old school physics, right? That's what a capacitor does, right? It stores. What does it store? Electricity, right? So the fitna is like a capacitor. It takes in your experiences, the Quran and Sunnah, your life, whatever the case may be, and it stores it and facilitates it, right? So it's not knowledge in and of itself, but it's like a, a capacity, a facilitator. So the fitrah has a very interesting role in acquiring truth. So we understand we have a fitrah, we have an innate nature that facilitates knowing Allah exists, knowing that He deserves worship, and basic good and evil. And in the Islamic tradition, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, even experiences in our life, even reasoning, rationality, Allah mentions this so many times in the Qur'an, they serve as almost triggers to awaken the fitrah. 
because we have the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said every child is born in a state of fitrah right but it's, it's, his, it's his parents who basically change their ways they become a Christian a Jew a Magian or whatever right so it's the society or the social effects that deviate the fitrah they veil the fitrah and therefore it can't find the true path but what the Quran does revelation sunnah experiences in your life even sound reasoning because the early pious predecessors they didn't differentiate between revelation and sound reason there's a difference between wrong reasoning and sound reasoning if you really use your mind properly without any baggage you could basically acquire certain fundamental truths so if you have sound reasoning so experience sound reasoning revelation quran and sunnah they serve as triggers to awaken the fitrah or unveil the fitrah and that therefore allows you to formulate that truth and that truth is self-evident why because if you go back to the quran allah what does he say to us he said to the progeny of adam alayhi salam who is your lord how did we reply exactly we said indeed you are our lord so there's a there is ikhtilaf on this issue in a deep way but generally speaking we have the self-evident truth that Allah is our Lord the fitrah facilitates that it could be veiled based on wrong knowledge based on wrong experiences based on having parents who are not Muslim in a society that veils the fitrah the Quran and Sunnah and reason and revelation and experiences unveil the fitrah so the truth of Tawheed could shine through does this make sense? Now the reason I've taken a long time to discuss this is because it shows that we don't start with doubt. We already know who our Lord is. The fitrah facilitates that. And if we don't have a veiled fitrah, then we'll come to that truth. If it's veiled, then when we engage with the Quran and the Sunnah, and we engage with experiences and with sound reason, it unveils our fitrah. Make sense? So far? Good. So it means that we, we don't start with doubt. We start with there is a truth. And this is why the ayat in the Quran, we have to understand them properly. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, right? We, we, sometimes we, we, we belittle the Quran in an, accidentally. When we see an ayah in the Quran that talks about, for example, the camels and how we created it. Or when the, Allah says that you are an alaqa, you are a nutfatin min maniyin. Or when Allah talks about natural phenomena, what do we do straight away? We say, ah, scientific miracle. This is rubbish. Sorry. This is wrong. Because what we've done, we've made science into a god now. We've deified science and we've limited the Quran. Science changes. I've just spent a whole year studying the philosophy of science on a postgrad level. And I'm telling you, there's no certainty in science. Study it. Just, just Google. Go type in scientific realism. Do it. Just type it in. There's a, an anti-realism. Instrumentalism. There's a big discussion on can scientific theories represent the state of affairs are they representations of the truth or are they just good models or are they just useful it's a big discussion and all of them agree now that even if you think science gives you absolute truth it can always change they are always defeasible i'll bring out my notes my postgrad notes for you to see now because you have some online idiots no offense i want to swear but you have online india idiots from you know the skeptic tradition and the the aggressive atheists they think oh you know science is like wahi it's like revelation it's not it changes even if it's a workable theory right even if it's well tested it changes if you study the history of science you see that even workable theories changed look at the famous theory of phlogiston in the 1700s they had this theory called phlogiston what phlogiston was is that things that could burn that were combustible they had something called phlogisticate phlogiston and when you burnt it it released phlogisticated air it was a theory it was working in the 1700s it was working so well that dan rutherford in 1772 or 1773 he used this workable theory and he discovered nitrogen but after a few years later they rejected phlogiston because it didn't they realized it wasn't working anymore it was falsified so this shows to us that you can get a truth from a false theory <laughs> that's the whole point and things that work could be false because it was working but then it ended up being false 
So you just have to understand when you study the philosophy of science and you study the history of science, you know that these are not absolutes. There's no absolutes. Even when you study induction, which is the method in how they basically formulate scientific conclusions, you see that induction doesn't lead to certainty. Read David Hume. And that's why these people don't even read their own Western philosophy. You know, David Hume, the famous argument that you're always going to have limited observations. How can you conclude for the general? Because you may have another observation that contradicts previous conclusions. Right? And we've seen this with cosmology. They believe in the steady state theory. Now they believe in the Big Bang. Now they don't know what they believe in. There are 17 different models to explain the same data. The data is underdetermined, meaning that the data can give you seven, that 17 different models explain the same data. There's no huck. I know you hear on YouTube some brothers saying Big Bang is truth. No, it's not. There's 17 different models. This is popular science. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is to show you. Actually, just get my notes back. I do apologize. So, the reason I'm mentioning this, brothers, is basically to show you that we don't start with doubt. And also that when you look into the Qur'an, don't think that the Qur'an is just talking about natural phenomena in a scientific way. These ayat, when they talk about natural phenomena, are there to awaken your fitrah. They move from a truth to a truth. They don't move from a known to an unknown. Let me repeat. Science moves from a known to an unknown. You have limited data, and then you move for an unknown, for the general data. Right? Just like in Darwinian evolution at the moment. Darwinism, right? Via natural selection. Evolution via natural selection. They have limited data and they conclude for the general. All theories work like that. There is no theory that basically has all the possible observations at their disposal to analyze. They don't, right? So they have limited data and they conclude for the general. So they move from a known to an unknown because they're generalizing. That's the nature of theories. And yes, they're workable and they've been tested, fair enough. But the point is, they never move from a known to a known. It's a known to an unknown. From limited data to the general. From a known to an unknown. From a limited to the general. Okay, that's, that's, how, that's how it moves. But in Islam, it doesn't have that element of doubt when it comes to these fundamentals. Because it moves from a known, look at the camel and how it's created, to awaken the fitrah, which facilitates our self-evident truth that we know our Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we basically said to Allah that you are our Lord. So it moves from a known to a known. So the role of ayat when they're talking about natural phenomena, when they're talking about man, life and the universe, is there to awaken whatever, what you already know. It doesn't move from a known to an unknown. It moves from a known, look at the camel, look at the trees, look at the sun, look at the moon, to Awaken the self-evident truth that Allah deserves to be worshipped. Let me give an example with my favorite toy when I was five years old. My favorite toy when I was five years old was Donald Duck. Everyone know Donald Duck? Yeah, I'm trying to do Donald Duck voice. It's not working, but that was Donald Duck. I had a plastic Donald Duck and his beak was like a bit chewed off. I think I used to chew it out of frustration sometimes, right? Now, say for example, fast forward 30 years. I'm 35 years old. Fast forward 30 years and I go to my mom's basement. She doesn't have a basement, just being hypothetical. And I'm helping her clear up. And I'm cleaning up all the bags. And all of a sudden, what do I find? All dusty with cobwebs. I find Donald Duck. And I forgot all about my favorite toy. What happens to me? Oh yeah, my toy. I remember I used to play with Donald Duck. Do you see what's happened here? It's a known to a known. When I was five years old, I remember playing with Donald Duck, but I forgot all about it. But then when I experienced Donald Duck, when I found him in my mom's basement, I'm like, oh yeah, it's awakened the truth within. Ayat in the Quran have this purpose. They awaken the fitrah, to awaken the truth that Allah is one and He deserves worship. It doesn't move from a known to an unknown. It moves from a known to a known. And that's why we don't start with doubt. This is so important for you to realize. Wallahi, it will change the way you look at the Quran. By the way, I'm not making this up. Just read Usul Tafsir, read the classical works. 
And that's how they saw the ayat when they're talking about natural phenomena. It was there to awaken the reality that Allah deserves worship. From rububiyyah to uluhiyyah. Allah's rububiyyah that He's the creator, He's the sole creator and sustainer of the universe to the fact that He deserves to be worshipped. That was the reality of the ayat, to move from rububiyyah to uluhiyyah. It's not to start from shak, start from doubt, from something vanni, to basically conclude something vanni. No, Allah is not vanni. No way. It's to, it's to move from a truth to a truth. The fact that you see and observe these things in the universe, there is a creative wisdom and power in the universe, and that awakens the reality within you via the fitrah, to awaken the self-evident truth that we know Allah is our Lord and deserves worship. Does this make sense? So therefore our epistemology is totally different. Epistemology means the study of knowledge. It's totally different. We don't start with the doubt. And this is why even when you give da'wah to non-Muslims, you have to appreciate this that they already know. That the role of, a, of the da'i, the role of the du'at is to act like a farmer, is to water the seed that already exists because they have that seed because they said to Allah you're our Lord so what is how do you water the seed with good akhlaq with love with compassion you water the seed with Quran Sunnah giving them good experiences good reasoning these are all things that water that seed for our human beings our brothers and sisters in humanity does that make sense it's a really profound way of looking at the Quran and a profound way of looking at the kind of knowledge in Islam. Okay? This is so important. Hopefully it'll give you an idea that, you know, you take a chill pill now. You don't have to start from doubt because you already know. Right? Because really, if you really think about it, if you always started from doubt, then you'd be doubting all the time. There'll be no truth. Really. So even the skeptics have to start with the truth. Do you know this? Someone who's a skeptic, who denies truth, who's skeptical, skeptical about truths, even fundamental truths, they're not really skeptics. They have to believe in some truth because they believe that there is no truth. And that's the truth for them, <laughs> right? Because if someone says to you, there is no such thing as truth, say, okay then, you know what you just said? Is that true? <laughs> that's how you beat a skeptic, basically. I know that's a very crude way of dealing with a skeptic, but essentially it reduces it to that point. If they say, oh, you don't know, how do you know? Uh, there can't be any truth. Okay. Is it true that there can't be any truth? Yeah. Well, you believe in the truth then. So you have to start with the fundamental. But that's what I'm trying to say. So really, skepticism doesn't really count for much because it has to start with the truth. But yeah, its whole philosophy is to deny truth. But they have to start with it. Make sense? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. So